Good morning, everybody. Something is happening within Catholicism in the United States. On the one hand, over the past few decades, many people have disaffiliated themselves from organized religion, and Catholicism has been particularly affected. On the other hand, there is a movement from a section of Catholics who find new energy in the more traditional Catholicism, characterized by the traditional Latin Mass, Mantias, communion rails, communion on the tongue only, a heightened emphasis on doctrine, on rituals, on vestments, incense, etc. There are people who think that, and are they people who think this way are convinced that Catholics disaffiliated themselves from Catholicism because of the loss of Catholic identity and the dilution of Catholic rituals and doctrines since Vatican II. That's in the 1960s. And then there are what I would call, or there is what I would call, mainstream Catholics. Many of us believe that the present crisis in Catholicism is not caused by Vatican II, but that Vatican II offers ways for the church to be relevant in the modern world if only we have the, the courage to implement its vision. These Catholics do not believe that going backwards is the answer to the challenges Catholicism faces today. So as we try to find the relevance of Catholicism and our faith in today's world, I want us to take a look at today's scripture to see how we can, what kind of guidance we can find. So in the first two points that I have for you today, I'm merely going to lay the context and then in my third point, offer some very uh, specific understanding and guidance. So first, let's understand Mark chapter 12. So if you look at this chapter, you'll find three groups of people who come to ask Jesus questions about the relevance of the law in Jesus' time. And there are three groups of people. First, the Pharisees. Second, the Sadducees. And thirdly, the scribes. Now, why were these three different groups that existed in Jesus' time? Much like the difference in opinion among traditional and progressive Catholics about the relevance of faith and religion, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and scribes interpreted Mosaic law differently. And keep this word interpretation in your mind because it's going to come over and over again. So these three groups of people, Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, they simply interpreted Mosaic law differently. The Sadducees were a priestly class who believed that the written Torah, the first five books of the Bible given by Moses, the written Tor Torah, was the only source of revelation and thus legally binding. The Pharisees, on the other hand, believed that the law that God gave to Moses was twofold. The written law and the oral law. The oral law consisted of the teachings of the prophets and the oral traditions of the Jewish people. And they considered the written and the oral law legally binding. Now the main reason they believed in the oral tradition was because they believed in the principle of doctrinal development. In other words, they believed that the Torah, which was given long time back, needed interpretation in applying it to contemporary problems. So in other words, if you have a problem, if you just quote Moses, 
it doesn't really solve the problem because it's not taking care of the issue that is rising now. So they believed in this oral and written tradition. And then there were the scribes. The scribes were not Pharisees, although some of them were Pharisees. They had knowledge of the law and drafted legal documents. And in those days, since there was no separation between the religious and secular institutions like today, scribes became an indispensable and elite social and religious class. They were very powerful people. There was at least one scribe in each village. Now, <laughs> to make matters just a little more complicated into this situation comes Jesus he belonged to neither of the groups he was the son of God and above it all but he would have to convince the social and religious elites that what he was proposing makes sense now remember these are very powerful people the scribes the the sadducees and the pharisees very powerful people if jesus came with a new interpretation he would have to convince them that what he was proposing was indeed legal and valid now the hope was that jesus would unify the people of god under the vision of the kingdom of god Remember, Jesus began his ministry by saying, the kingdom of God is at hand. History and the Gospels tell us that this is not what happened. In this time of fierce debates and varying interpretations of the law, Jesus was eliminated. My second point it's all in the interpretation. Why did the Sadducees, scribes, and Pharisees oppose Jesus, first of all? The simple answer is that it was about the interpretation of the law. The Sadducees opposed Jesus because, like the scribes and Pharisees, Jesus was a proponent of the resurrection. The scribes and Pharisees opposed Jesus because Jesus rejected their interpretation of the Mosaic law. Jesus had his own interpretation, which the scribes and the Pharisees called blasphemy. For example, Jesus would not only heal on the Sabbath, he would also forgive sins. And the question was, who are you to forgive sins? We are the leaders. Or again, Jesus defended his disciples who according to the Pharisees were breaking the Sabbath by pulling grain off the plants, rubbing it in their hands and eating it. Their interpretation was that the disciples were breaking the Sabbath. But Jesus had a different interpretation. Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So you see how the interpretation was very different. Now the entire Sermon on the Mount is a novel interpretation of the law, of faith and of religion. Remember six times Jesus said, you've heard that it was said of all, do, th do this, but I'm telling you, do this. So there's a whole new interpretation that Jesus proposes. The other reason the scribes and Pharisees opposed Jesus was because he broke the law by eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners. Instead, he praised the outcasts and showed the Pharisees and the scribes that they needed conversion too. And of course, the other reason is that Jesus disturbs the status quo. In the Gospel of Matthew, it's the Pharisees who became the primary opposers of Jesus. But in the Gospel of Mark, it's the scribes. So, the reason I'm saying this is because in today's gospel, who's the one who comes and asks Jesus about the commandment? It was a scribe. It was a legal question. It was a scribe who asked the question, which is the first of all the commandments? And everybody was listening what Jesus is going to say because there are different interpretations. What would Jesus say? So, Jesus better get this right. Right? 
And so then Jesus gives us interpretation. The first commandment is really two. Jesus' answer to the scribe shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and then love your neighbor was a new interpretation of the law. So first of all, Jesus begins by quoting Moses. I'll tell you what, someday I'm going to write a little book on that Jesus was one of the most brilliant minds that has ever lived. He's brilliant. Like on the go, he comes up with stuff that, whew. So Jesus begins with Moses for a reason. Because he knows the Sadducees and how they think. He knows how the Pharisees think. He knows how the scribes think. So he begins with what is called the Shema Israel. That is our today's first reading. What is Shema Israel? Every Jew knew this and today even know this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. But then, Jesus took a concept already present in the law. This is not new. He already took, he took a concept already present in the law, the concept of the love of neighbor, and made it central. So he pulls it from wherever it exists in the tradition, and he makes it central along with the commandment to love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. By doing so, he essentially said, that all other commandments come from the two core principles of love of God and love of neighbor. And this is his new interpretation. Now Jesus' answer can be seen as a new way of interpreting and applying the existing commandments. What is the interpretation? Instead of focusing on just the outward observance of the law, Jesus' central focus was on the internal motivations and the attitudes behind the observance of the law. Jesus did good because the scribe said to Jesus, you have answered correctly. But Mark tells us it was not the scribe's approval of Jesus that mattered, it was Jesus who was going to have the last word because he is the son of God. Jesus told the scribe, you are not far from the kingdom of God. So now this brings us to the present crisis in Catholicism. What is authentic Catholicism? So for me, this is my interpretation. You may choose to agree or disagree, but if you disagree, do it lovingly. First, Jesus and the Gospels teach us that if our Mass, if our sacraments, if our rituals, our doctrines, our worship, and our devotions do not spring from and do not lead us to genuine love of God and love of neighbor, then whether we do it in Latin or English, whether the priest faces the altar or the people, whether we receive communion on kneeling or on the tongue or standing and in our hands, whether the priest wears cassocks or not, whether the women wear mantillas or not, if our religion does not spring from and lead us toward the love of God and love of neighbor, then everything else is irrelevant. Catholicism and all about it primarily has to be about love of God and love of neighbor. Everything else has to come from these two core principles. Secondly, for me personally, if Catholicism must be relevant in the contemporary world, the answer in, does not lie in cultural antiquity or in medievalism, but in an authentic living out of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, people are only going to come to Christ because we authentically live the message of Jesus. Jesus. 
Jesus' entire life, message, ministry, suffering, death, and resurrection can be summarized in one commandment. Love God and love your neighbor. That is the life of Jesus. That is the entire mission of Jesus. So for us, everything, this mass, this singing, these rituals, these people sitting here, the liturgy of the word, our funerals, our baptisms, our, our, our weddings, our, our, our adorations, our devotions, everything that we do, everything that we do, your morning and evening prayer, everything must be based on Jesus and the gospel that he proclaimed. It is love God and love your neighbor, and that is the new Shema. I pray that our authentic living of the gospel of Jesus Christ will make our faith and our religion relevant in our times. People of God said,